the Millennium Challenge Corporation is a U.S. institution that provides economic assistance in the form of grants to developing countries through a competitive selection process that demonstrates positive performance in three broad areas. MCC determines country eligibility through a series of quantitative third-party indicators that assess policy performance, and these indicators fall into three broad areas. One is ruling justly, two, investing in people, and three, fostering economic freedom. Over the years, number of selected countries were unable to benefit from MCC grants due to various factors, including their failure to adhere to democratic practices, corruption, political tension, human rights violations, and so on and so forth. The major focus area of development under MCC grant program have been roads, agriculture, energy, health, education, community services, water supply, and sanitation. There is a particular reason for the Pathfinder Foundation to engage in this exercise. As you may be aware, there have been considerable discussion and debate on the merits and demerits of the two projects. Bearing in mind the fact that the single objective of MCC is to reduce poverty through economic growth, which allows it to pursue development objectives in a targeted manner, the intention of the Pathfinder Foundation is to subject the proposed compact as well as specific projects to scrutiny. There is a saying attributed to St. Jerome contained in a letter sent by him to the Ephesians dating back to 400 AD, in which he had said, Noli equidentes inspicere donati. The, two, uh, the 480 mi million that would be dispersed under the compact is a grant from the American taxpayers' money. And what we are doing today is exactly the opposite of what St. Jerome said. That is, we are examining the teeth of a gift horse. And I might add, the Pathfinder Foundation is doing just that for sake of transparency. There are many questions that may be asked today. Is this the first time is Sri Lanka is receiving a grant from the United States? What other countries have given grants to Sri Lanka over the years and have they caused any controversies? Do the projects address the core target MCC uh, ideology that is reducing poverty through economic growth? What are the reasons for con the controversy around the compact with the MCC? We have a distinguished panel and the members have kindly consented to discuss specifics of the compact and how the two projects would impact on the country and our people. Um, the first point I want to make is really this thing about grants versus loans, and that's a potential benefit of this particular instrument. Um, this is a grant, meaning that it is uh, money that does not have to be repaid to the MCC. It came out of a very competitive process. Um, and the amount of $480 million is quite a significant amount. It's over five years. It's equivalent to 22.43 cents, so sorry, $22.43 cents for every Sri Lankan, okay? Now, I was thinking aloud about how to kind of set that out for you all, um, and to kind of put it simply, I like to think in terms of butt packets. Um, so every Sri Lankan gets the equivalent of 13 free bath packets um, at 300 rupees a bath packet, right? And we all like bath, no? Um, now, if it were a loan, on the other hand, it would have to be paid back with interest, and that would be a different story, right? Um, I'm going to be a little mischievous, and I'm just going to assume a loan, okay? Uh, and let's say assume it was at the rate of 6.3%, which, by the way, was the first loan in the Hambantota project, yeah? If you make some assumptions about the duration and the way in which the interest is to be paid, this would give Sri Lanka a total debt of 
$1.5 million for the use of this money, okay? So that's the kind of policy choice, uh, which is very clear. So in Bath Packard terms, hmm, that is $30 for every Sri Lankan, or every Sri Lankan would have to give 18 Bath Packets to the lender of that $651 million, okay? So one benefit is a grant. Yeah, that's very clear in my mind. A second um, thing that I want to mention to you is um, something I see as a benefit, which is it helps to rebalance the sources of development finance of the country. Yeah? Kind of, this is kind of good news. Um, the good news for Sri Lanka is that it's now an upper middle income country, but the bad news, and I'm sorry to say that there is, is that we are heavily reliant on foreign development assistance of different types, mainly because we have a twin de deficit problem of a balance of payments deficit and a budget deficit, and we have a very low tax base and very high government spending. Uh, these are historic issues for the country. Sri Lanka's infrastructure quality um, really falls well below that of an upper middle income country. Okay. The evidence on that is that we come out as 65th out of 144 countries on the World Economic Forum's uh, infrastructure quality index, which is not very good. This exercise was completed in September 2017. Although the analysis identified three binding constraints to economic growth, namely lack of access to land, policy uncertainty, and inadequate overland transport, the MCC and the government of Sri Lanka decided to limit its scope to two constraints, namely inadequate transport logistics infrastructure and planning and the lack of access to land for agriculture, the service sector, and, industri and industrial investors. The revised national physical plan is based on growth corridors. It is reported that the revised plan has been approved by the National Physical Planning Council, the head of which is the president, and it is expected to be gasseted shortly. In summary, while there are certain positive features in the transport project, the negative outweighs the positive <coughs> because the Colombo Trinco Economic Corridor would divide the population into haves and have nots on either side of the corridor, the fact that would be a source of serious instability. As for the land project, it is bound to encounter serious constitutional challenges before it would become reality. Thank you. Since we started off referring to St. Jerome's uh, comment on gift horses and their teeth, let me also continue in the same vein. Yes, even a gift horse's teeth must be examined <laughs> because the horse may not have any teeth or the teeth may be decayed because at the end of the day, you have to have the burden of looking after that horse. Uh, the MCC Co uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation was established in 2004 by Congress. It was intended to be an independent body performing some of the tasks of USAID, but performing them better. It, although intended to be independent, like any corporation established anywhere in the world by statute, uh, it is not that exactly independent. The head of the MCC is, uh, the current head, is Sean Cancross, and he was a senior advisor to President Trump previously. So one would expect that the policies of the Trump administration would seep down to this corporation in the implementation of his objectives. I have no problem with that. That happens in every country, and we have to live with it. The MCC is not necessarily uh, a totally altruistic organization. It is there uh, as, a, as a tool to pursue the different 
objectives of the U.S. government. And these objectives might include political objectives. Another problem with uh, the compact as it stands, and it's a fairly lengthy document, I have it here, but, and it runs into something like 60 or 70 pages. And it impacts extensively on the domestic legal framework of Sri Lanka. <coughs> it grants immunities to the U.S. government, its employees uh, operating under the compact. It has an impact on the land laws of Sri Lanka. Some of these laws have been around for a long time, uh, but it, is, it has an impact on these laws. Then it has an impact on the financial management of the government of Sri Lanka. And then, of course, the government is also required to provide resources to ensure that the compact is implemented properly. And all this happens within the framework of the MCC compact. And the impact on the domestic sphere is enormous. And I'm going to explain to you why this is important from my perspective as an international lawyer and as an international treaty lawyer. The compact is not just another contract. It is a treaty. A treaty is governed by international law, not by domestic law. Uh, and, there's, and it's very clear. And so this is a document that impacts on a whole range of domestic laws, regulations, and practices, but it is going to be governed by international law. Uh, the question immediately arises in the case of a dispute or a disagreement, where do you go for a solution? Uh, certainly not before the District Court of Colombo, because the treaty itself says clearly there's a provision in the, in the document which says that it will be governed by international law. And then, of course, it means you bring into the equation a whole range of rules uh, which are incorporated in the 1969 Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and also other practices relating to treaty law. And then another thing about a treaty is that if you're unhappy with it or you're dissatisfied with it, you can't simply walk out of it. It says that you can give 30 days notice and denounce the treaty. Both sides can do that. But you know when you enter into an agreement of this nature, especially when you're getting 450 plus million dollars of butt packets, <laughs> you cannot simply denounce it because you, you, uh, it's worse than the debt trap to which we are supposed to have got ourselves into international agreements can be negotiated and negotiated to reflect your own concerns and your own interests. You do not, in my experience at least, you do not enter into an international agreement which is determined by one party only. And as somebody who has been around the traps, I know that when aid is given, a considerable part of that aid goes back to the donor. And very importantly, the provision of the treaty says that the U.S. assumes no liability for any harm caused in the implementation of this agreement. Uh, so you might have a U, uh, U.S. corporation uh, executing certain functions under the agreement, causing serious damage to individuals or property, but the U.S. government, under the provisions of this treaty, assumes no responsibility for any harm so caused. Similarly, U.S. government employees of the MCC shall be immune from the jurisdiction of Sri Lankan courts. Uh, you recall in, at a discussion a few uh, weeks ago, we subjected the SOFA to an analysis. And one of the problems that we had with the SOFA was the extensive immunity that it provides U.S. personnel who may be deployed in Sri Lanka. And then uh, I think it's also very important that the legislature be made aware to some extent. An agreement of this nature, which will have huge repercussions or an implications for the country and to the population, it should have been discussed 
uh, in our parliament, or at least uh, members of parliament, should have been given the opportunity to express their views. After all, we are talking about transparency, we are emphasizing transparency, and we are living in a democracy. I, I don't know everything about MCC, uh, but MCC certainly engaged with Verite Research and myself at the very early stages uh, to help think about the transport aspect. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things I think we have to be careful about uh, when we look at how we engage in conversation to have a better democracy, to have a better outcome. So I, I struggle a lot that the government does not tell us, you know, this is the contract, this is the agreement. Uh, we have to fight hard all the time to get information. That's not right. When MCC gives us money, we can't create a false equivalence between that and uh, a defense agreement that we have. So I think these mistakes that we make in the democratic practice of debate and helping our society to think better, and I agree we should think better. We should evaluate more. Uh, our government doesn't do that. Our bureaucracy doesn't do that. But we should avoid misinformation. We should avoid speculation that really is a little baseless. Uh, and, and I think false equivalence is also a problem in this debate. Uh, I am sure that the MCC compact can be improved and usually you have to put in the work to improve it even as you go along. Environmental impact studies surely have to be done. Uh, I, I think we should, we should look at the country first, not at politics first, and prioritize the value to the country and not to any particular political party or position. And, and then th there's, a, there's a way to move forward. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I will speak on behalf of MCC briefly, if I may. Uh, my name is Jenner Edelman, and I am the newly hired country director for the MCC program here. Uh, first of all, I'm pleased to report that we do have congressional approval to enter into this compact for the full $480 million, if that's what the Sri Lankan people would like. Uh, all of our programs, on program admin, there have been a few comments about the 10% of the $480 million going to program administration. Uh, that is standard across all MCC compacts globally. Uh, there have also been some comments about uh, five years, what happens after five years if the government hasn't dispersed all of the money. Uh, that's really up to the partner government. The way our model works, the program is implemented by a group of Sri Lankan professionals. We will be hiring approximately 60, 65 Sri Lankan professionals who will be responsible for the day-to-day -day implementation of this program. And that work will be overseen by a board of Sri Lankans. So how much money stays in Sri Lanka at the end of the day will depend on the pace of the Sri Lankan implementing team that is hired to implement this program. Um, there's also been a lot of discussion, and I understand this, around the choice of projects, uh, economic corridors, activities, why are we working in land? One thing that distinguishes MCC's model from that of other donors is our focus on country ownership. Country ownership is really important to us. And what does that mean and what does that look like here? It means that our program is developed by the Sri Lankan people by the government in extensive consultation with the private sector and civil society, and it's implemented by a team of Sri Lankans. There will only be two Americans here, myself and one other person overseeing the implementation of this program, but it will be, it will be you, the people of Sri Lanka, who are responsible for, for its success. Uh, we have 18 months to really fully design this program before we get to this entry into force. Um, another just point of information, the, the negotiations uh, over the compact and the terms occurred last October. There was a delegation of 15 uh, individuals from the Sri Lankan government led by the Ministry of Finance and the Attorney General's office. Um, but I, I promise you that we will be having more of these kinds of discussions. We'll be putting more information out there. Um, I'm just curious as to what uh, is the reason that this document that has been worked on for the, since 2015 to 2017, the MCC project is not in the public domain at this time? Because in a sense, we're all sort of talking pie in the sky because we really don't know what, what the document contains and hence the great deal of speculation about it. So perhaps the organizers or 
I'm missing a voice from our MCC itself who might have clarified what exactly this is all about. Uh, speak to these issues. The state land, will it be given out to others other than Sri Lankans? And what is the extent of that land which will extend throughout that corridor? That means will somebody else be owning this? And will all that land be coming under different legal systems and laws? In which case, it is definitely going to affect, uh, for instance, military operations. This, this whole thing, we should uh, be approved by parliament, any of, of this nature which affects the sovereignty of the country. In most dual states, I work in 40 odd countries, and I found they have a little bit of a piece of legislation called ratification of treaties act. Even in dual states, a treaty which affects the integrity or affects the sovereignty or has enormous impact on the economy, like the EU treaty, they are placed before parliament by law. Although the dualist, monist uh, division still applies, these exceptions have been carved into the legal systems of the common law countries. And therefore, it's a time that your organization or your organization should draft a little piece of legislation called the Ratification of the Treaties Act, so that this type of agreement is gone before parliament, before it is finally ratified by, uh, by the, our executive arm of the government. But it could have been much more uh, transparent. This could have been taken much more to the ground level. Today, it's a very distinguished, kind of very rarely we, we be able to put together this kind of parliament. All are, almost all are of very, of a certain caliber. But this is Columbus 7, PMIC, nice air conditioned place. This is a crowd. But this project, MCC, goes much beyond that kind of area. And English is a language probably very comfortable with only 20, 30% of the population. There, is, there are the two languages import. Therefore, my take is that from this discussion, Take what it is and what it is not. Even today, what was underlying thing was what it is not. Because that is how the newspapers, social media, I mean, everybody interpreted in one way or the other. And the, the distinguished participant who was seated next to me was asking, where are the documents? You know, it's, there is something missing, no? To do or disseminate, discuss, analyze projects of this nature, if they are willing with the MCC team here, even with anybody else, because that is where we get the satisfaction. 